just like to uh, acknowledge the Indigenous owners of our land. Just indulge me for a moment before I um, introduce Joel. I was just reading a book that was written in 1880, 1888 by the so-called Prince Anarchist, uh, Peter Kropotkin, um, in a book around local farming that he wrote back then. And it said, while science devotes its chief attention to industrial pursuits, a limited number of lovers of nature and a legion of workers whose very names will remain unknown to posterity have created of late a quite new agriculture as superior to the old three field system of our ancestors. Science seldom guided them and sometimes misguided, as was the case with Liebig's theories, developed to the extreme by his followers who induced us to treat plants as glass recipients of chemical drugs and who forgot that the only science capable of dealing with life and growth is physiology, not chemistry. Interesting. Right, so here we have a modern Kropotkin, <laughs> although that might be a bit controversial. <laughs> And um, Joel has been an inspiration to many of us, and uh, he and he's. I'd certainly like to say that it's not just Joel; it's also his family. You can't do this as a lone person. You've got to have a great family behind you, and uh, I'm a recipient of that as well, as are the others who uh, whose shoulders I'm standing on here. Um, Joel, I would, in all of my travels, I would have to say he he gets more out of grass than anybody else. We're, we're very, very fortunate to have him here. His schedule is amazing and uh, to still go home and fit in farming and be able to go to all the places that he does and help people out and be as genuine, genuine and consistent as, as he is is a credit to his mother and father. And I'd like to introduce Mr Joel Salton. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in the capital of Canberra, uh, the city. Uh, you know, I don't think I've done a presentation just like this in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so you have to put on a coat and go 200 miles away from home before you're an expert, you know. And uh, I'm way more than 200 miles away from home tonight. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is not talk about our farm, uh, but because I am in such a prestigious, ostentious world policy walk center, I'm going to talk about the politics of food. And uh, I essentially have 12 areas to deal with. And the more I travel and the more I deal with food issues today, I realize uh, that we are in a cycle that is repeating what the world went through 500 years ago with a cycle on religious inquisitions. We are now 500 years later, I do believe in cycles, you know, pendulum swing and cycles happen. We are now in a food inquisition. And so I want to talk to you about this inquisition because the people who are administering this food inquisition and putting farmers like me on the rack have a certain set of assumptions. So what I'm going to do is go down through about 12 assumptions and then my answer to the inquisitors. Number one, oh, you can't feed the world. You can't be serious. You can't feed the world. This is crazy. See, this is really important because ultimately... The reason these inquisitors can go in and sit in their pews on Sunday and take the sacraments and feel good about themselves, about protecting the world from people like us, is as long as they really believe that I want to starve half the world, they're doing the world a favor. If we can't settle the feeding the world issue, then the whole ecological food movement might as well go home. It's that important. So, let's deal with that issue. Let's get the context right. 
Justice von Liebig in 1837, what a great introduction. That was, you know, yeah, that was 1888, right? 1888? Yeah, it could have been written yesterday. Justice von Liebig in 1837 in Austria told the world that all biology and life is made up of just simply a reconfiguration of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. That's all you are, that's all the tomato is, that's all anything is. It's just nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Well, by 1900, the world was in a panic because it was growing, the population was growing, and by 1900, there was no more Australia to discover and there was no more United States to discover. And so where are we going to grow this food? The dust storms were happening. The land degradation was happening. John Steinbeck wrote uh, The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, Little House on the Prairie was over, you know. The Oregon Trail was done. And there was this universal concern about soil fertility, how we're going to feed the world. And so one track developed their idea from the mechanistic ideas of Justice von Liebig, that it's just all a big machine. But there was another track that developed out of that that was the beginning of the land ethic movement. John, John Murr, uh, uh, Audubon, names that you're familiar with, um, Sand Cal County Almanac, uh, Aldo Leopold. Numerous ecologists came out of that and said, no, life is fundamentally non-mechanistic. It is dynamic, it's spontaneous, it, you know, it, has, it has spirit, okay? Um, and so it, it, it is fundamentally not a mechanical procedure. And so that group started moving on the direction. How, how do we interact with this living world? And how do we maintain the soil fertility? Viewing soil as fundamentally a living organism. You know, there are actually more living things in a handful of soil than there are people on the face of the earth. If you look under an electron microscope, you know, you'll see a big old wobbly, you know, bug come walking through the, the, the plane of the electron microscope, you know, and then here comes something charging in from one o'clock. Watch out, one o'clock, you know. He comes in with this big long sword on the end of his thing, hits that big old, you know, bubbly, bumbly, bumbly thing, and it explodes with juice, you know, and he sucks it out and desiccates it, and, you know, and before that big old bumbly, bumbly thing can hit the ground, another six-legged thing comes walking in from 10 o'clock, and with a big scissors on his front like antenna and knocks off his head and eats it up. You know, that's what's going on in the soil. <laughs> well, we've got this idea that it's just this, this inert stuff, you know, that we intravenous N, P, and K and you know, you know, and it sits there and, and, and it goes up the veins of the plant, you know, like celery and, and food dyes in the elementary school. Well, what was happening was that these two schools of thought were racing for a solution, both of them very sincerely minded for a solution to the world, feed the world problem. By 1943, they had it pretty well worked out. And Sir Albert Howard, a Britisher who was running the experiment station in Indore, India, by 1943, he had spent 27 years in India and developed what we know today as the scientific aerobic system of composting based on life is fundamentally biology. Here was the problem, though. 1943 saw the world in a very interesting situation, a time of great disturbance. Anybody... Know what that, I'm talking about, yeah, okay, okay, okay. come on, we're, okay. It's WWII time, and the world has one focus, how to win that war. Well, it just so happens that bombs are made out of N, P, and K. And so the whole world attention turned to the, the development, the chemistry, and the distribution of N, P, and K for bombs. 
Now we're post-World War II. The war is over. It's done. We've got all of this latent buildings, infrastructure, investments, Wall Street, time tied up in NPK making bombs. You're a farmer in 1947. You don't have rural electrification. You don't have chippers. You don't have uh, uh, little hydraulic uh, front end loaders, tractors. I mean, you know, uh, some counties in America didn't even get rural electrification until 1965. And Sir Albert Howard's uh, gift to the world of scientific aerobic composting came before all of this infrastructure was developed to leverage that gift of innovative knowledge. But what the world did have was the chemistry, the distribution system, and the uh, manufacturing capability to make NP and K. And besides, for I don't know why, but for some reason, bombs have always seemed to be more sexy than compost pile. <laughs> Although I would suggest there's a lot more sex happening in a compost pile than a bomb. <laughs> And so what we had was Farmer X in whatever country, and he says, well, you know, I can go over here with my pitchfork and a machete and chop up carbon and biomass and pitchfork it and try to do this, this, this composting thing, or I can get this little bag of NP and K. Which would you do? See, the problem was, that in nine, it was like in 1946, 47, a, a sh starting gun went off. Now we're going to really, you know, go with agriculture, feed the world, you know, and all this. And these two people lined up on the track, but the, the mechanical one had a two-lap advantage. And the war effort paid for the development and, and all of the, the metabolism of the knowledge that is always a ragged edge that slinky comes behind the tip of the innovation. I mean, we see it right today in the e-commerce revolution. You know, governments, state governments, federal governments, national governments are in apoplexy on how to uh, um, track taxes when it's all done on the internet. Where did the sale occur? So we have this, this e-boom that's driving tax collectors wild because the e-boom is the tip of the, of the uh, marketing innovation today and it takes a while for policy, for understanding, for infrastructure, for encryption and all these things to metabolize the tip of the innovation. Are you with me? There's this lag time. And so the lag time on our side of the production equation was about 30 or 40 years. That's how long it took to get rural electrification. To get, I mean, now we have all sorts of things. We got electric fencing, electronetting, front end loaders, chippers, four wheel drive tractors. We didn't even have PTO powered manure spreaders. Are we going to go out and just you know shovel this stuff out on, on the field? We've got hoop structures, canvas coverings, bandsaw mills, all sorts of stuff that we didn't have then that allowed us finally to truly leverage and metabolize Sir Albert Howard's gift. Now we have electromagnetized foliar sprays uh, being played with loudspeakers of calypso music to make the stomata open up real good and suck in foliar adjuvants. Okay? So now our side is spinning circles around the other because we have... We did it. We, we metabolized the information. We didn't have a Manhattan Project to give the other side an unfair advantage. That's the truth. And so this perception that, boy, if we, I'm sure glad we had the Green Revolution and all those chemical fertilizers, half of us would be dead. That's a bunch of hooey. If we'd have had a Manhattan Project for compost, not only would we have fed the world, we would have done it without making three-legged salamanders and infertile frogs. <laughs> That's one response. The second response is that we have tons of unused land. In the U.S., we have 35 million acres of lawn. We have 36 million acres housing and growing food for recreational horses. And let's not talk about golf courses. 
There is tons of land, unused land. In fact, that's enough land in the U.S. to feed the entire country without even having a farm. Don't tell me we can't feed the world. Number three, we, need, we could do tons of things if we embed and integrate our food system so that we close the loops. For example, every single kitchen should have an attached enough chickens to eat the scraps coming out of that chicken. Why do people, you know, use a bunch of uh, uh, diesel fuel to take scraps from kitchens out 10 miles to a composting operation and then get green awards because they're composting? That's not green. Green is affixing a chicken house to the, to the college kitchen and sending all the scraps into the chicken house and then running the eggs right back to the chicken and there's nobody has to deliver anything anywhere. If you live in the city, you, know, you can have two parakeets. Get rid of the parakeets. They just make noise anyway. Put two chickens in there. Feed them your kitchen, chickens, your, your kitchen scraps. And they will cackle and give you two eggs a day. If everybody did this, there would not even be an egg commerce in the world. That's green. See? That's embedding and integrating the cycles through the food system. Number four, 50%, excellent, 50% of all food in the U.S., uh, in, in the world, spoils. This is edible food. This is not, you know, uh, peelings. This is edible food, spoils. In fact, if anybody in this room tonight had a superpower and could... Click your fingers, and suddenly tomorrow, double the food production in the world. It would not affect one single hungry person. Because nobody goes hungry because there's not enough food. They go hungry because some, somebody stands over the submachine gun keeping the, keeping the Red Cross truck from passing uh, a, 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 um, you know, a guerrilla checkpoint into the refugee camp. And finally, we measure food production in a crazy way. You want to know how food production gets measured today? Here's what's on the front page of the newspaper. Here's what the paper print. You know, study finds uh, GMO rice um, uh, more productive than, you know, indigenous species. That's the front page of the newspaper. Here's how that study was done. Here's how it happened. This is the truth. So we're going to study GMO, genetically modified organism, productivity. So somebody in Australia, the U.S., Great Britain somewhere, you know, that's got a lot of money. They get together some, uh, they get together a Ph.D. And the United Nations has this grant money. So a Ph.D. that likes to write grants, you know, and sit there and fucked over his computer all the time, you know, he writes this grant to go to Vietnam. He's always wanted to see that country anyway and do a food study. So the Ph.D. takes a couple little, you know, nice little uh, M.A. Uh, master's uh, degree uh, candidates to, to, to tow his uh, luggage behind him and, you know, control all the data. And they go out to Vietnam and set up their feeding plots. They've got their GMO rice here and they've got, here's the indigenous plot. And the indigenous plot has rice in it. It's got um, uh, tilapias to eat the snails and, and the little scum underneath the water. And it's got uh, ducks in there to eat the weeds that grow and, uh, and lay eggs and grow meat. And then surrounding this uh, patty is bok choy, arugula, and Chinese cabbage. This one, you know, they nuke it real good with chemical fertilizers, and they dump all the chemicals on it, and boy, does it grow rice. And so they take their data sheets, and they grow the rice, and they cut it, and they measure the rice. And the conclusion is... Wow, look at all this rice. This rice over here, why, wow, everybody's starving, they ate that rice. But, 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 but what about the tilapia, the fish? What about the ducks? What about the eggs? What about the, the bok choy and the arugula? Well, we came to study rice! And that, folks, is exactly the kind of science that will be on the front page of tomorrow's newspapers tomorrow.
It happens every single day, and the duplicitous sheeple just follow it. You get that? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we can feed the world. Not only can we feed the world, we are the only system ultimately that actually can feed the world. It's only in massaging, symbiotic, synergistic, relational, nurtured, complex relationships, biomimicking what we see as pattern, as templates of pattern in nature. Those are the systems that are actually competitive and productive. Number two, the next great assumption. We'll have to hustle. Well, you really just want us to go back to loincloths, washboards, hog collar, and tuberculosis, don't you? <laughs> right? Absolutely. Okay, let's set the context again. Set the context again. Innovation. Around 1910, 1912, you know that in the U.S., in the U.S., every metropolitan paper in 1912 was carrying editorials uh, um, prophesying the elimination of cities by 1915 because they would be covered up in horse manure. <laughs> Here's what was happening. Urbanization was the cultural innovation of the time. And just like all other innovation, there's a, there's, there's a tip that moves forward. And the tip was people moving into the cities. And they were moving into the cities faster than there was, there was no refrigeration. There were still open sewers. Indoor plumbing. I mean, people were still taking one bath a winter. And crowding into cities. Without refrigeration, how do you feed them? Well, how do, how do you get them beer? Well, we put the breweries into the cities because there's no refrigeration. The beer has to be next to the people. Well, the beer makes distiller's grains as a byproduct. Well, milk is a good counterpart of beer. So we'll put the dairies eating the distiller's grains, which now makes acidosis in the rumen of the cows, makes the cows have tuberculosis and brucellosis, and now we can feed the people the milk, and they get it. And the fact is that the urbanization of innovation that preceded electrification, petroleum, antibiotics, uh, um, um, hygienic sewers, soap for crying out loud. I mean, at that time, doctors were still debating whether they should watch their wash their surgical instruments between amputations. And so what we had, we had, we had terrible conditions on the newly industrializing farms. We were starting to industrialize pigs before we had concrete, rebar, antibiotics, and front end loaders and flush systems. We were, we were putting dairies next to breweries because we didn't have refrigeration. There was a 20 to 30 year period of time there in which the urbanization of Western cultures preceded the, the, the policy and the infrastructural requirements to metabolize that innovation tip of cultural change. And today, much of the hysteria about natural farming is all based on a 20 to 30 year ragged edge period of time while innovation was sorting out the necessary infrastructure to metabolize the urban innovation tip. Does that make sense? Sure, I'm glad it does. So that's the truth. Now we have, now we have hot water, refrigeration, lights so we can see the dirt, vacuum cleaners, washing machines, pipe. I mean, imagine, imagine a time when you couldn't even put water in a pipe. Canvas covers, portable infrastructure, I mean, all sorts of stuff that allowed us to metabolize that. So we're not interested in going back to loincloths or washboards or hog collar or tuberculosis just because we want to, to go to a, an ecologically 
correct a biomimic type, type of system does not mean we're Luddites and wanting to go back to some sort of a Neanderthal culture. We want to go into the future carrying the appropriate uh, uh, technological advances we've had for the last century, but with a very strong anchor hold on natural templates and biomimicry as we move into the future.